until now, you've been treating combustion as just uh, sort of not spontaneous, but a sort of just a magic heat release. A certain amount of energy comes out, and we just take that for granted through, throughout the cycle. So, for example, in our um, in our let's let's draw this in PV. So I'm going to draw a cycle diagram. So in the ideal Otto cycle, we would have compression. And then we have this, so compression is uh, isentropic compression in the ideal cycle, non-isentropic if we have losses. Um, so we have isentropic compression up until top dead center. And then combustion occurs as the release of a certain amount of, here I'll draw that in red. So we have the release of energy oh, like this. This is combustion. Up until our state, I usually label this three. I can label the other ones. One two, there's state three, and then we have expansion. It's our ideal cycle. It's, uh, it's our isentropic expansion. And if we have losses, then it's non-isentropic up until state four. So, so far we've assumed that T3 minus T2, well, this is a certain amount of energy. So mass times CP, this was equal to some amount of Q in which uh, some amount per kilogram of mixture, usually it's like 1800, 2000 kilojoules per, kilo, uh, per kilogram of mixture. Uh, or we've related this as from the heating value. So QHV, this is the amount of energy that's released per kilogram of fuel. So not counting the air. And then we have to divide this by the air fuel ratio plus one to make this per kilogram of mixture. And if it's not ideal combustion, or if it's not perfect combustion, we usually uh, add in our a to C, which is our, is our combustion efficiency, like this. Okay, we, have, we haven't really discussed where these, uh, where these numbers come from. Where does this QN come from? Uh, or where does this QHV come from? Um, so combustion occurs, this is the, combustion is the transformation of reactants into products. So when we go from state two to state three, so two to three, that's the transformation of reactants at state two into products at state three. And it's that transformation that releases a certain amount of energy. It's actually the, it's actually the breaking of bonds. So one example, if we have, uh, let's say it's a natural gas powered engine, just because it makes it an easier molecule to draw. So natural gas is by and large, it's mostly methane. So we can write this as CH4, this would be a certain amount of methane plus a certain amount of, well, usually if it's, uh, I mean, if it's a rocket, we're carrying the oxygen with us, but any other kind of engine, if it's a, a plane or a boat engine or a car, a truck, a train, uh, we're, we're bringing the oxidizer from the air or from the ambient air. We're grabbing the oxygen from the air. So our, uh, the, the, right, the correct way to say this, what I'm trying to say correctly is that these cars are grabbing the oxygen from the surrounding air which means that the oxidizer is not oxygen, it's not pure oxygen, it's actually oxygen mixed with nitrogen. So here I'll write, I'll write both uh, possibilities here. We have oxygen, so if this were a rocket, for example, that is uh, powered by uh, liquid methane, then we would have methane coming in, which is one atom of carbon with four hydrogen atoms stuck to it, like this. And then we have oxygen molecules, O2, that come in together. There may be several. And here there's a there's a number that usually fits in here. And now this goes to, and the products of the combustion of CH4 with O2 is going to be mostly CO2. If it's sort of the perfect kind of combustion uh, we've learned in uh, essentially high school or CJEP, then it's CO2 plus water and uh, well, depending on this number, if it's a if it's a perfect kind of combustion, or or what we would call complete combustion, then I would have only CO2 and H2O. So in complete combustion, we're saying that everything that is here, I'm going to write this here. This is the definition of complete combustion. So in complete combustion, all of the carbon goes to CO2, all of the hydrogens in the reactants go to H2O. And if there's any nitrogen inside the reactants, uh, it is going to remain as N2. Um, yes, so in this particular case, we would have, uh, in order for this to be true, then I have to match the numbers on either side. And 
I actually have, I'm, I'm sort of jumping ahead here, but this is it's because this is a, a, a manipulation that you've normally seen before in introductory, um, uh, in introductory, uh, um, what do we call this, chemistry courses. So I have one free parameter, right? This is uh, really this equation represents ratios. So I, I could have one molecule of CH4, I could have, I could have one mole of CH4, which is a 6. Uh, 19 times 10 to the 23 or six. Uh, um, so this very, very large number of molecules, or I could have five molecules or five moles. It doesn't really matter. What matters is the ratio. So I have one, I have one free parameters in these equations all the time. And so I, by, by definition, we often pick the fuel to be one, whatever, one amount of CH4 uh, is going to go. So if I have a one over here, I'm going to write it explicitly. If I have a one, that means I have one amount of, of carbon on the left side are what we call our reactants. So this is reactants. And that means I have to have the same amount on the right-hand side, what we call the products. So one amount of CH4 means I have to have one amount of CO2 so that I have the same amount on both sides. And actually, that is how we are, um, that's how we are, uh, um, that is how we are matching uh, we're doing our, our what we call the stoichiometric um, stoichiometric balance. So this is the, the I'm going to write the procedure for stoichiometric stoichiometric balance. So it's I count every different type of atoms, not molecules, but every different type of atoms in uh, whichever side, on the reactant side, usually. So C, H. So C is a type of atom. H is a type of atom. O is a type of atom, like this. And then they have to be equal on the left and the right. So I have one. So on the reactant side, I have one amount of C. I have one times four. I have four amounts of hydrogen. And I have here, I'm going to put a variable. A, I'm going to have two A amounts of oxygen. And that has to match. Here, I'm going to start over. I'm going to erase the one. I'm going to put variables there. I have to have X number of CO2 molecules. I have to have Y number of H2O molecules. And so that means I have to have X times one. So it has to be X amount of CO2. Well, now I get the, this one. This one gives me the answer directly. For hydrogen, I have to have two times y, right? H two, so two y is equal to four. So now that gives me y is equal to four over two is equal to two. So now that gives me the number of molecules or the, the multiplier of molecules of H two O, and A is two A on the reactant side is the amount of oxygen in my reactants, gives me two times C, or sorry, two times X plus one times y. Um, and in this equation now, I know, uh, let's see. Well, I don't know a, but I know x and y, so I can actually solve this equation. So this tells me a is equal to 2x over 2 is x plus y over 2. x is equal to 1, so this will be 1. And y is equal to 2, so plus 2 over 2 means it's 2. So here's this means my value of a is equal to two. So I could actually come here and erase this a, and I'm going to write it in red. This is now two. Here, actually, let me put in the answer. I'm going to put the answer to each of these. I'm going to put them in red. We said this is one molecule of CO2 or one mole of CO2 and two moles of H2O, like this. So in red is what we've determined to be. This is what we call our stoichiometric balance. Stoichiometric balance. Or there's a, well, as a consequence, what we call this ratio of methane to oxygen, this is our stoichiometric ratio. Um, or we would call this, this is a stoichiometrically or stoichio, stoichio, oops, sorry, 
mixture of CH4 and O2. That is another way to say stoichiometric is that means that I have just enough oxidizer. And in this case, here I didn't quite define these words. I'm going to put them in orange. Um, this here is what we call the fuel. That there is what we call the oxidizer. So a stoichiometric mixture is one where there's just enough oxidizer to balance out the fuel so that in my products, when I consider complete combustion, I have only CO2, H2O, and maybe nitrogen if my oxidizer has nitrogen in it. In this particular case, my, nitri my oxidizer is, uh, is O2, is pure oxygen. There is no nitrogen in there. Uh, and hence, uh, I can't, um, well, I can't have nitrogen in the products. I can't come out of nowhere. You could have, you have some uh, molecules, you could have some uh, reactive molecules, some fuels that will contain nitrogen inside their own molecule, in which case you would have nitrogen inside the products, even with pure oxygen. Um, so this is an example of balancing the stoichiometry with oxygen. But as we've said, for most vehicles that we consider, whether it be cars, trains, planes, basically if, you're, if your vehicle is moving through the atmosphere, uh, chances are it's actually using the ambient air as an oxidizer. So we're going to do an example of calculating the, those stoichiometric ratios uh, for air. But before we do that, we have to ask the question, well, what, what is air? Well, actually, let me, let me go backwards. I think I forgot to finally uh, answer that question. So A, why, why, why are we doing all of this? I jumped a couple of steps. So we're doing all of this because the rearranging of the molecular bonds in the reactants, right? Notice the, in our reactants, yeah, I'm running out of colors, I'll pick blue. These, these bonds over here between the carbon and the hydrogen and the bonds in, in between the oxygen atoms are gonna get rearranged so that in my products, we have CO2. I'm gonna draw them in black. So I'm gonna have CO2 molecules like this, and then H2O molecules. So H, H, with an oxygen in between. Those bonds are literally the different bonds. They're bonds between different molecules. And so they're going to have a different amount of energy. And this is what gives us the amount of, or this is what gives us energy out. So we often will write it explicitly. CH4 plus O2 goes to CO2 plus H2O plus, you know, some amount delta Q some amount of heat that's been liberated by the rearranging of those chemical bonds. Uh, so since the rearranging of those chemical bonds is what gives me the amount of energy out, well, in order to figure out how much energy I'm going to get, then I need to know how many bonds I have of each. And this is why we're doing the stoichiometric balance. Okay, so we've just done an example of a stoichiometric balance between CH4 and O2. Um, now, what about air? Okay, what if I had methane but burning with air? Um, now, first question is, what's air? Okay, so air is a, here, let me, I'm going to clear all of the drawings. So air, so first is, what is air? Okay, well, air is a mixture itself of mostly, so it's mostly oxygen, oh, sorry. That's not true. It's mostly nitrogen, a lot of oxygen, and then there's some trace gases. There's usually some CO2, a little bit of argon. Top, 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 top. We could include more. Actually, there's often water vapor, H2O. I'm going to put a little V. So this is H2O, V stands for vapor. So any air that's around us has some amount of water molecules floating about. This is actually, this is what gives us, so this is what gives us um, humidity. No, the humidity, uh, humidity ratio, or specific 
uh, the humidity ratio or a specific humidity. Oh. Specific humidity or the relative humidity, which is what we get on the news reports. So if it is, so right now in my, in my basement, it's, for example, 20 degrees Celsius and about 30% relative humidity. It's the amount of water inside of the air. Okay. Um, the CO2 and the argon, they're trace gases. Sometimes we include them, sometimes not. Um, so we often neglect this. And the pure mixture of nitrogen and oxygen, if we assume just those two in air, this is what we call dry air. Just those two is dry air. Okay. So one, um, well, one first question we want to uh, we want to tackle is how much. Uh, what is the ratio of these two or what what's the well how do we we sort of know uh, intuitively you should have learned it at some point you should have come across this fact at some point but we we, we sort of know what the composition of air is is we often say it's um so often we abbreviate air composition it's abbreviated as 79, whoops, it's a 9% nitrogen, 21% oxygen. Um, well, to, for this, for these ratios to make sense, we have to say how, sort of how, how they're measured. So this is 79% nitrogen, 21% oxygen by mole. So for each, uh, for each one, uh, for each one molecule of Oxygen, well, hold on. For each 0 0.21 molecules of oxygen, now that's not a very neat number. Uh, this is, it's not a very neat number because you can't have fractions of molecules, right? You either have a molecule of O2 or you don't. So let's just get this, let's just get this number here. Let me just get this number as uh, on the basis of the number of molecules of oxygen. So 79 to 21, that's the number of moles of, uh, let's say, nitrogen over the number of moles of oxygen. And we say this is equal to 0 0.79, where I have 79% nitrogen for every 21% oxygen. And if I carry this, um, yeah, if I carry this out, this is equal to actually let me let me rewrite this a little bit. Let me just bring in the total. Um, just introduce a new uh, a new word. So I'm I'm just gonna say I'm just gonna rewrite this. It's not gonna change the math, but the number of moles of N2 I could say this is equal to the number of moles of N2 over the total number of moles inside the box, and I'm going to divide this by the number of moles of oxygen divided by the total number of moles. This is, and this, this ratio here, inside of a mixture, the number of moles of something over the total number of moles that I have, this is what we call the mole fraction. So this is the, and we usually term the mole fraction y, usually use y as a variable. So I will write this y and two, this is the mole fraction of n2 in the mix mixture. And then on the bottom, this is the mole fraction of O2. So this whole thing now is YN2 over YO2. And the 79% is what it means. So 79% is there's 79% of nitrogen inside of the box of all of the molecules there. So it's the same number as here. And if I divide one by the other, I'll find that this number is equal to 3.76. Ah, so now for every one molecule of oxygen, I have 3.76 moles of nitrogen. Um, 
well, if I wanted round numbers on both, I would have to use 21, right? For every 21 molecule of oxygen, I've got 79 molecules of nitrogen. We like to keep this number in mind because that's very, very useful when we are um, when we're doing a stoichiometric balance. Before we do the, an example of a stoichiometric balance, um, I want to let's let's calculate something. Uh, let's calculate the molar mass of air. So what's the molar mass of so what's the molar mass of a, a of a substance m i of any substance it's equal to the mass of that substance so if i give you a box full of oxygen the molar mass of this oxygen is going to be the amount of mass of oxygen inside the box divided by the number of moles of whatever it is that's inside the, the box this is sort of by definition and that's a property. So for a for a pure substance, for a pure substance, that's a property of matter. It's a property of matter. That is, if I give you oxygen, um, and actually you can work it out from the number of protons and neutrons inside of the inside of the nucleus. Uh, so let's see. So for our oxygen, it's uh, eight is the atomic number, and so that means there's uh, usually eight neutrons along with it. So it would be 16 grams per mole. Well, that is for O. That is for pure oxygen. So if we have a molecule of two oxygens, that means in every molecule, I have 16 times two. I have 32 grams per molecule, and I can that turns out to be actually it's per per mole is the the way of um, uh, the way it actually works out. I guess the way the mole number works out. So the molar mass of O2 is equal to 16 plus 16 is equal to 32 grams per mole. And that's just a that's a given, right? If you have an O2 molecule. That's the that's the that's the molar mass of that molecule. Nitrogen, for example, is equal to two times n. Um, so I I just doubled the atomic number. But if you look in the periodic uh, in the uh, periodic chart, you usually have the atomic number, and then off to the right you have the molar mass of that element. So for nitrogen, it's an atomic number of seven, and it's actually, if you look on the right, it's fourteen point and a bunch of digits. And uh, which 14 is sort of a good enough approximation. So 2 times n is 2 times 14. That means it's 28 grams per mole. Uh, CO2, for example, would be C is 6. So that's actually 12. And oxygen is 16. So it's 2 times 16 plus 6 is 2 fois 16, 32 plus 12. That's 44. It's 44 grams per mole. And that's a given. That's a that's a property of matter. If I give you CO2, that's its molar mass. Uh, well, now if I give you air, it's a ratio of two things. So it's not a property of the molecules. It's a property of the mixture as a whole. So what's the... Sorry, I've just lost my cursor. There we go. So what's the molar mass of, I'm going to say dry air? It's going to be equal to the mass of each. So it's going to be the mass of oxygen. Uh, plus the mass of nitrogen over the total number of moles is equal to, uh, well, the mass of oxygen is, I can get that if I know the number of moles, that's the number of moles of oxygen times the molar mass of oxygen. That's what the molar mass allows me to do, right? If I know the molar mass, then I know how much mass in kilogram weighs one mole of uh, molecules or of atoms, whatever I'm considering. So plus the number of moles of nitrogen times the molar mass of nitrogen divided by the total number of moles. And now I can distribute this total number of moles and you can see why uh, the mole fraction is useful. This is NO2 over N total. This is telling me this is the mole fraction of oxygen times the mole, molar mass of oxygen plus you have the mole fraction of nitrogen times the molar mass of nitrogen. And actually the general rule for any mixture is 
by definition, the molar mass of a mixture is just equal to the sum over all the components of that mixture of their mole fraction times the molar mass of that species. Um, so if we plug the numbers in, so this is equal to YO2 is 0.21 multiplied by the molar mass of O2, we said is 32 grams per mole plus 0 0.79 multiplied by 28 grams per mole. And I'm going to, I'm going to re I'm going to punch it in now because depending on how you approximate and how many digits you kept in the molar mass, you get slightly different answers, but 0.21 times 32 plus 0.79 times 28 gives me 28.84. 28.84. Four grams per mole. Awesome. That is the molar mass of um, that is the molar mass of air. But what's one thing we can calculate directly? If you remember, I'm gonna for this. Um, I'm going to erase a couple of things. Actually, here let me try a new feature. I'd never seen, apparently we can have, oh, for mole, and here I'm just going to put a new, new page. So one thing I can uh, look at, so we know that the universal gas constant, that's the 8.314, and this is kilojoules per kilogram. Uh, I always get those units wrong. Hold on, I'm going to pause my. So it's 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin, or often you'll see it 8.314. This is kilojoules per kilomole Kelvin. Kilomole is a thousand moles. Um, now that universal gas constant, this is it's in terms of moles, but in our ideal gas law, whenever we use density, we want this specific gas constant. So we say the R specific, and that's why we call it specific because it's specific to a given uh, substance. So the specific gas constant, by definition, is just the universal gas constant divided by the molar mass of whatever species we're, or whatever substance we're looking at. So the specific gas constant of dry air is equal to 8.314 kilojoules per kilomole. Kelvin divided by, we said it's 28.84. This was grams per mole. And I'm going to make my units match. So this is, well, I'm going to multiply by 1,000, divide by 1,000. So it's going to be kilograms per kilomole, right? If one mole weighs 28 grams, then 1,000 moles has to weigh 28 kilograms. And then if we plot that in, 8.314 divided by 28.84, I get zero. 0.288 and some digits kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. Okay, and this is uh, yeah, that's right. And if you notice, this is so the number I always give in the exams. I always say you can assume that R specific for air is equal to 0.287 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin, right? I always give this in exams. Well, now you can, if you, if you forget what it is, you can actually recompute it. You know where this comes from. You know where this 28.84 comes from. Well, air is 0.79 times 28 grams per mole time plus 0.21 times 32 grams per mole. That gives me this bottom number. And then 8.314 should be sort of built into you. And 8.314 divided by this 28.84 gives me exactly the number I expected. So 0 0.28, 0 0.288. I usually give 0.287. This just depends on the exact ratio of oxygen to nitrogen and then the exact molar mass. Um, so this is where those digits come from in the, in the, um, uh, in the molar mass of the individual elements. Uh, sometimes there's isotopes that have uh, uh, one more neutron or not and so on. Uh, there's a ratio of those. So on average, it works out to this fractional, um, slightly higher fractional number um yeah and so sort of the common accepted value is 0.287 um okay 
Now we also have, here I'm just going to get my slides back so I can not completely lose my train of thought. Um, so this is a standard dry, what we call standard dry air. We often want to know also how many moles of water are there in the air. Um, because the, uh, well, we want to know how many moles of water are there um, inside the air. And this is the, uh, this is going to given by uh, the humidity ratio. So if omega is equal to the mass of omega is by definition is what we call the humidity ratio. It's equal to in some vat of air, it's equal to the mass of water divided by the mass of air. And it's kind of an inconvenient, well, it's a very useful yet inconvenient number because we don't, we don't know what the maximum value is. Or actually the maximum value of omega is dependent on temperature. So we often like to report phi, which is the relative humidity. And that's equal to pH2O, what we call the partial pressure of water divided by the saturation pressure of water at temperature T. Um, here, let me, this is a definition. So this is the specific humidity and this is what we call the relative humidity Um, before I continue, let me just take a little break. And so, um, why do we, why do we want to know this, right? Why do we want to know how much water there is in the air? Cause afterwards that, that water is, is, if that water exists in, uh, uh in the reactants, then it's not going to burn. I mean, water doesn't burn. It's going to, it's one of the products. So it's just going to show up as extra water in the product. So why do I actually want to know where this comes from? And the reason is here, let me see if I can. I'm going to stop the share. I'm going to share a slightly different screen. So here's a plot of, I'm going to make it a bit bigger. So the composition of standard moist air. So what we have on the bottom here, this is the relative, uh, this is the, sorry, the specific humidity, right? This is kilograms of water per kilogram of air. So when it's zero, this is dry air. And as it goes up, this is uh, more and more moisture. So it's wetter and wetter air. And we have a dashed line here, which represents sort of normal air or standard air, uh, what we would assume is, is uh, standard air. And so we, we're gonna normalize everything by these numbers. Uh, this is why they, all of these lines cross here at zero because we're representing the variation of different quantities from the standardized air. Um, so we're looking at, so this top line over here, this is R, this is the specific, uh, uh, the specific gas constant, and we see it actually has a variation of you know, minus a tiny little bit, minus one percent, but up to five or six percent higher as the air is more and more moist. CV and CP, right? These show up in in um, in our heat balances to get what our temperatures are going to be, and we find that CV, well, CV can vary by four to five percent as it's getting more and more wet. And gamma is actually as here it says gamma, but it's what I've, we've called K throughout this class. This is the uh, adiabatic constant. This is CP over CV. And as you can see, this is, you know, this can go down by 2%. And K is a thermal conductivity. Um, so that can also vary by like almost 6%. So there's a huge, well, there's huge, not a factor of two, but there's a sizable variation of different quantities that are of, um, uh, much importance in our calculations as we add moisture to um, to our um, as we add moisture to our substance uh, to our air to our oxidizer. Okay, so we have two ways of specifying humidity. I have the relative humidity and the specific humidity. Uh, the specific humidity tells me how much water there actually is. The relative humidity. That one is a number that's going to sit in between zero and one. And in order to know this, I have to define, we're going to define here. This is the partial pressure of 
of water. So let's just remind ourselves what's a partial pressure. So if I have a box, if I have a box of air, there's a certain you know, there's a certain number of molecules of oxygen floating about in there. There's a lot of molecules of nitrogen inside that box as well. I'm not going to draw all of them because for every for every oxygen molecules, I would have to draw three and some molecules of nitrogen. And then there's some molecules of water, H2O. There's an H2O over here. And I'm going to put another little one here. There we go. So I have all of these molecules. And when we deal with stuff as an ideal gas, we're making the assumption that everything inside, uh, everything inside the box, every molecule inside the box is basically occupying the entire space. So I could make these thought experiments where I would split this box. I would keep the same, imagine the same box, the same volume of box, but I would put in only the oxygen molecules. I think I drew three. And then I would put in another box of the same volume, only the nitrogen molecules. Here, I'm not going to draw all of them. Up, up, up. And then in a third box, I would separate out these box all have the same volume. I would put only the H2O, only the water molecules. Maybe check this. Okay. Let me add a page. So what happens then? Well, each of these boxes, right? Each of these, each of these boxes of molecules um, obeys the ideal gas law. So each, we're assuming this is an assumption we're making, but we're assuming that each of these components is an ideal gas. And when I put them all together, they are still an ideal gas. So if that's the case, that means that individually, in my box, the pressure when I've when I've uh, well for the full mixture, let's say when everything is together. The pressure of everything in the box has to be times the volume has to be equal to the total number inside the box of the of molecules of moles times R, sort of the average R, but R is specific. Oh, sorry, that's not true. Here I've put moles, so it's actually R universal times T. But so this has to be true because the mixture is an ideal gas, but also. The, when I've yanked out the oxygen, that has to obey the ideal gas law. So the pressure of the oxygen, and it's the same volume of box, has to be equal to the number of moles of oxygen times the universal gas constant times T. And I'm going to make sure when I take them apart that I keep the temperature constant for each component. So this applies to the nitrogen as well. We go to N, N2, R universal T. And the same thing applies for the water. H2O, volume, number of moles of water, R universal, T. There we go. Um, so these four statements have to be true. Well, I can divide here. I'm going to call this statement T for total. This is a statement one, statement two, statement three. So one divided by the total would be equal to the left side divided by this. I'm going to get PO2 over P. The volumes are going to cancel out. That has to be equal to the number of moles of oxygen divided by the total number of moles, which is equal to, and then R universals is a constant. The Ts are kept constant. So that's the only thing that remains of that ratio. And that's equal to the mole fraction of oxygen. And I can do the same thing for two over the total. This is going to give me the pressure of nitrogen over the total pressure is equal to N and two over N total is equal to Y and two. Same thing for the water. PH2O over P is equal to NH2O over N total is equal to YH2O like this. And this is what we call this is what we call the partial pressure or these these components there this is what we call the partial pressures essentially it's saying if i took a box of my mixture and i took out all of the molecules that are not what i'm interested in and i kept in that same box at the same temperature just a subset of the molecules 
then the resulting pressure would be the partial pressure. So we can write this as PO2 is equal to YO2 times the total pressure inside the box. PN2 is equal to YN2 times the total pressure. PH2O is equal to YH2O times P. And I could take the sum of these and we'll see that the partial pressure of oxygen plus the partial pressure of nitrogen plus the partial pressure of water, all three together is equal to, well, there's just one, this is a P, it's all the same P, so I can take it out of the sum. So total pressure multiplied by YO2 plus YN2 plus YH2O. Well, this is the sum of the fraction of each, and if I have only these three components, then by definition, you know, the fraction of one plus the fraction of two plus, it has to be equal to one. That's the total amount of stuff. So it has, that has to be equal to one. So I could actually just take this out completely. And I find that the sum of the partial pressures is just the total pressure inside the box, or it's the total pressure of my mixture. And that's what the partial pressure is. So as I add more and more water, if I make the air more and more moist, then uh, at a given temperature, then its partial pressure is going to go up, up until the point where its partial pressure reaches the saturation pressure. So if you remember the vapor dome here, we're going to draw it in TV. This is specific volume, this is temperature. Here is our vapor dome. I'm going to draw one isobar like that. This is a P is equal to a constant line. Um, yes. So let's see. Well, this is a P is equal to a constant line. I'm going to draw a few. There's one over here. And here's another. These are all constant pressure lines. They're just different, different pressures. So pressure goes up in this direction and pressure goes down when I go in that direction. So let's say I'm at some condition of the box, temperature and specific volume, which puts me over here. So when I calculate the partial pressure of water, um, I'm at that point, I'm at that point there. And then I'm going to increase the amount of, um, I'm going to increase the amount of water inside of my box. I'm going to increase the mole fraction of water. I'm going to increase the relative humidity. I'm going to increase the specific humidity. At constant temperature, what that means is we're moving like this, right? And this is, and we're moving. Notice we're 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 coming to. Here I'm going to draw one more. Pressure is equal to a constant. We're coming to higher and higher pressure lines, and at some point we're going to hit the vapor dome. And if you remember the vapor dome on the left side here, it's liquid. On the right side, it's gaseous. And in between, it's mixed. I have liquid and gas in my mixture. So what this says is that the, the water is, um, the water is, there's more and more water inside of my box. And then when I hit the vapor dome, uh, it starts raining. That's basically what happens is that I can't, I can't add any more water. Um, I can't add any more gaseous water to this mixture. And what happens is that the mixture of water has to, the water itself, its pressure is now, uh, is now going to get too high to sustain, um, uh, to sustain uh, um, the gaseous state, if you will, or to be in the gaseous state. So some of the molecules are actually going to precipitate out and you're going to get condensation. You're going to get liquid water. So then as you add water, you'll get more and more water up until you get, well, you, you never get all the way to this side here. So I'm, basically going to start adding more and more liquid water that's just going to condense somewhere in my box. So this is what we call the relative humidity. And actually, when we when we hit the vapor dome, well, before we hit the vapor dome, we're no longer an ideal gas. But when we hit the vapor dome, we're definitely no longer an ideal gas. Some of the water is liquid, and it drops down. So my, my assumptions fail out. So this is what we term, this is the 100% the, uh, relativity or the 100 percent relative humidity point so this is the actually that is the um, um 
yeah, that was our definition here. I can step back. That was our definition of the relative humidity is equal to the partial pressure of water over the saturation pressure, which is the maximum pressure I can have inside the box. Um, the maximum partial pressure of water that I can have before I get condensation. And that would be 100% relative humidity or what we would call fully moist air. And it's a function of temperature because for the vapor dome, as we increase the temperature, the saturation pressure changes um, or what we call the boiling pressure, if you will. Um, so I'm just wondering now if I want to give that example. But if you basically, if you if your air is at 100 degrees Celsius, then we know that the boiling pressure of water 100 degrees Celsius is one atmosphere. So that would be the max. But as the temperature goes down, that saturation pressure also goes down. Haha. -ha. Okay. So that is phi. It's a neat number. We can get it easily. We have devices. We have weather reports and so on. So I can know what the relative humidity is. Um, I would want to know what's the um, what's the specific humidity ratio, right? The mass of water over the mass of air or the mass of dry air. Um, I'm going to make a new page, and we can relate these two. So omega is equal to by definition is the mass of H2O over the mass of the air component, so the mass of the dry air, which is equal to the mass of water is gonna be equal to the molecular mass, the molar mass of water multiplied by its number of moles over uh, the molecular mass of dry air. That's the 28.84 grams per mole times the number of moles of, I'm going to drop the dry, but the number of moles of dry air. And that's going to be, let's see, what is, uh, O is 16, H is 1, so 17, 18. So this is 18 grams per mole divided by uh, 28.84 grams per mole. If you look in the slides, we abbreviated it or we rounded up to 29, multiplied by the number of moles of water over the number of moles of air. Well, that's the the number of moles of something is just it's it's that's the partial pressure times the total number of moles. So that's going to work out to being the partial pressure of water over the partial pressure of the air, which is equal to. So this 18 over 28.24, this works out to being 0 0.62. And then this pressure ratio, this is going to be pH2O, the partial pressure of water over, well, the partial pressure of just the air component without the moisture is gonna be the total pressure minus pH2O. And by definition, the partial pressure of water is the saturation pressure times the relative humidity so omega is equal to 0 0.62. And I'm going to have one term here. This is going to be a phi. This is my relative humidity multiplied by the saturation pressure of water at a given temperature divided by the total pressure minus phi p sat. And then I could, you know, we could work it out. This is also this is equal to the mass of water. This is the number of moles of water multiplied by the molar mass of water over. Oh, well, actually, I don't even need to work that out. But the the here, let me just erase this out. So this is the specific humidity. I'm just doing this. The specific humidity is a. This is a mass ratio. This part of the equation is the mole ratio. This is the number of moles of water over the number of moles of air. So we could use this in our stoichiometric values. OK. Um, let's do an example now of a stoichiometric balance with air. I'm going to make a new. Um, let's see. So now let's. Uh, what is. Well, let's burn methane again. So let's say we have methane, CH4 plus, and now I'm not burning with pure oxygen. Uh, I'm going to burn it with 
um, I'm going to burn it with air. So the way I usually write this is I will say O2 plus. So I put the brackets, so O2 plus, and I know that for every mole of oxygen, I have to bring in 3.76 moles of nitrogen. This is going to go to CO2 plus H2O plus, and now there has to be nitrogen left over right, for my complete combustion. Okay, now I like to write it like this with O2 as one, because then I, I, I wouldn't actually even need to think now, because I've done this before. Uh, it's just that I have extra nitrogen in the mix, but let's do it consensusly anyway. So let's look at carbon. I've got one carbon on the left. This is equal to, I'm going to put it A, X, Y, Z. Uh, so it's going to be equal to X. And then I have hydrogen is equal to four on the left. It's going to be equal to two Y. So I know that Y is equal to four over two is equal to two. And then I'm going to count up the oxygen. I'm going to have two A. The left is equal to two X plus Y. And this doesn't count any, uh, this doesn't add any oxygen. So I'm going to get A is equal to x plus y over 2a is the same thing as before. 1 plus 1 is equal to 2. And then the nitrogen, actually, I know everything on the left side now, but the nitrogen now gives me um, 3.76 times 2a times 2 times a is equal to, no nitrogen or that, 2z. Okay, so the 2s are going to cancel out. So this gives me Z is equal to 3.76 times A, which makes sense, right? Because A is the number of moles of oxygen. Um, and so Z is going to be 3.76 times that. This is, the, uh, this is the amount of moles of nitrogen, because for every molecule of, of oxygen, I have to bring in 3.76 molecules of nitrogen. Um, and so 3.76 times 2 is 7.52. And now that is my balanced or what we call stoichiometric 3.76 and 2 goes to CO2 plus 2H2O plus 7.52 moles of nitrogen. And now this is my balanced stoichiometric Uh, uh, reaction equation. If we were to do that exercise with several different fuels, then we would get, so here we have examples of our balanced stoichiometric reactions for different fuels. So for methane, we have, this is the two that we computed before. Uh, we have here propane, this gives me five multiplying the number of moles, uh, well, not the number of moles of air, this is the number of moles of oxygen plus a whole bunch of nitrogen with it. So we find that as the more complex gets this uh, hydrocarbon uh, um, molecule, right, as, as there's more and more atoms inside the hydrocarbon molecule, uh, the higher, the more oxygen I need to burn entirely um, this molecule. 